Hey everyone, welcome to Locked on Lakers for Friday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky, LeBron James stunned with his performance at the Olympics. Are the Lakers wasting what's left of the rest of his career? We'll talk about it next with Michael Pina from The Ringer. You are Locked on Lakers, your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks to everybody for making Locked on Lakers first listen of every day, Monday through Friday, no matter how or where you get your podcasts. This one's always going to be free and never behind a paywall. Locked on Lakers on YouTube. It's where you can go hang out with over 25,000 subscribers. Please do leave us questions and comments. We read them every day and we use them uh, as inspiration for show topics. We sometimes will obviously uh, pull the, the comments and the questions themselves so you get to be a part of the show. We want to use that stuff as much as possible. We also love when you guys leave us suggestions for uh, guests like the one that we have with us today. We'll get to that in a second. I want to let you know that today through uh, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL mm -hmm. Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Of course, we're all seeing those videos of people giving their significant others their two weeks notice now that football season is coming because they will be unavailable on weekends and now Mondays and Thursdays and like Christmas and like basically every day. Um, not sure uh, what Michael Pena's plans are. He's got a lot of NBA stuff to uh, to to get to. We remember uh, mentioned the, the guest for today. He's from The Ringer, one of our favorite people to talk to, one of the smartest NBA writers out there. Thanks so much for coming on, Michael. We appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. So um, you had in the wake of the Olympics a really interesting uh, story uh, column that you had up on the ringer about LeBron James and his performance in the Olympics and what the Lakers are doing with this sort of last chapter of his career. Nothing, <laughs> not, says Michael. Not a damn thing. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> they, can, they can read the rail. The first question is, are the Lakers squandering LeBron? <laughs> True. I mean, the name of the story is the Lakers are completely squandering LeBron's final act. It is true. The the headline writer at the ringer did kind of give it away <laughs> with that. Um, when you, Just before we get to that, though, you have all kinds of numbers in there about just how dominant LeBron was with Team USA and how important he was. Um, were you at all surprised to still see that? I mean, given the quality of that roster, given his age, things like that. I was. I have the utmost respect for LeBron, obviously, but he is 39, turning 40 years old. And coming into this Olympics, I thought that it was, I mean, there were articles about, is LeBron going to be the sixth man of the team? That was one article that was written in The Athletic going into the Olympics. Um and, you know, was this going to be kind of a, a showcase for Anthony Edwards and uh, coming off his playoff run and Jason Tatum coming off his ch first championship and some of the younger up and coming talent more so than LeBron being the leader in points, assists, rebounds. Or he was near that um, and just being the 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 run stopper the the guy who was going to guard Nikola Jokic and Victor Wembanyama in crunch time of of key elimination games um, and he was incredible he was their best player he won MVP of the tournament and I don't think even the biggest LeBron James fan um, anticipated that I thought I thought it was just a remarkable stretch of, of basketball from him. Yeah, one of the things we've talked about, Michael, uh, recently in light of that performance from LeBron and you know winning that MVP award, winning the IST MVP, the upcoming season with Bronny is I think he's very cognizant of the idea of things that I can add to my legacy, to my resume, the chapters of the history book that are really unique. I mean, at this point, if he wins another NBA championship, it will obviously be great, and five is greater than four. But in a lot of ways, I don't think it really does much to bait LeBron's legacy. Like, if you're somebody who believes in MJ 6 and 0 case closed, nothing's going to change that. And because of that, I think he really 
seeks the opportunity to pick these kind of spots like we saw with Team USA. Yeah, I think that's all fair. I think that it's just, you know, you know, I'm looking at it from the standpoint of, first of all, I, I, you know, I think he thinks, and he has said this on the record, that he is the greatest basketball player ever. Um, so he already thinks that, which a lot of people would agree with him. And that is a perfectly reasonable, <laughs> perfectly reasonable stance. Um, and it kind of is, you know, looking at his production and looking at how good he is still, I think that it's just a, it's only right for him to be competing at the highest level still and to still be, and I, I also feel this way about Steph Curry with the Golden State Warriors, very similar situation. Um, and it just is kind of just as a basketball fan, it saddens me to see him in a situation where I don't know what you guys feel, but I don't see the Lakers as um, seriously competing, even though the Western Conference, I feel like, doesn't have a, a top tier juggernaut. I don't feel that the Los Angeles Lakers are a serious uh, contender to make a deep playoff run. And I think the, the static nature of the front office and what they've done to the roster over the past couple of years would reflect that they are not very, they don't, they don't feel a sense of urgency in the same way that other front offices have throughout LeBron's career. When I still think LeBron, I look, I know that the Olympics are like a six week stretch run and he's surrounded by like the most talent. I think that this team was like the most talented team ever put together. And like, and he had two months off before he was going to do it. Right. And I think that, you know, and he's, he's going up against teams that, don't have NBA talent like Serbia. They barely beat Serbia. It has one, like two players, three, maybe three players um, who are in the NBA. So it's just all those caveats are, are, are deserved here when we're talking about how good he was in the Olympics. Um, but I still think that he has shown um, just standing next to the pe his peers standing next to Tatum yeah. who just won a title and being like, so much better <laughs> like it's so i think that is um that reflects just like the what i wish to be a more urgent front office and organization um in terms of you know putting piece, yeah. the correct pieces around him to win at the highest level which i still think he is capable of doing and i want to we, we want to get into some of the like how the, some of these behaviors and choices that the the lakers have made because you, again in the story you really break down a lot of these things but the last thing before we break i wanted to ask you was you, you talked, you mentioned this, that it's not an apples to apples comparison, the Olympics to, uh, to an NBA regular season in the playoffs. I mean, I mm -hmm. think everybody understands that, but like, can you make it a, a comparison that it's like fruit to fruit? Like, what can you pull from the Olympic experience that is, you think, instructive for how the Lakers could, you know, need to respond or what the effectiveness of, of LeBron, whether it is the type of players whether it's protecting him as much as possible to be able to, you know, keep him as fresh as possible. What, what is part of that template when you consider the greatness of LeBron that you can look at the Olympics and say, there's still something there for a regular season in the playoffs. What stood out to me are, were two things. Uh, number one is poise. I mean, he was the most under control player. I know his, he had a bunch of turnovers, whatever. He was the most under control and in the moment player throughout the entire run. Nothing seemed to rattle him at all. Um, and I thought that the playmaking was mm -hmm. so brilliant and watching him operate in space, which is something that he hasn't necessarily had the last couple of years. When you just look at the um, how the Lakers are constructed and, you know, their three point rate numbers relative to everyone else in the league. Um, so surrounding him with just certain pieces, and I'm not saying he needs Devin Booker and Steph Curry and like the, some of the greatest players in the league. Do it, Rob. Do it. <laughs> but just get your like, bleep together, man. <laughs> sensible two-way players who can knock down wide open shots or who uh, have to be respected behind the three-point line. Um, I think they're they're hard to find and hard to acquire, but it's not like impossible if that is your your focus and i feel like they have intentionally gone after players who don't have those skill sets um and they've built their teams and the, they've had different aims and goals in terms of how they want to construct their team um and so 
Yeah, just like putting the ball in LeBron's hands and letting him just be the smartest guy on the court who's also maybe the strongest guy and sometimes the fastest guy. Uh, that still that really stood out to me. I think that that totally translates in an NBA We should, we should all be those things when we're 40. Um, <laughs> all right, so let, we'll break some of these things down. You make some really interesting points, too, about uh, continuity and change and when the Lakers pull uh, on those particular levers, uh, which we'll get to next. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by FanDuel, and you've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Well, we got something a little different for you. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Again, 5 bucks, and you get the three-week trial. I promise you that is a great, great use of 5 bucks. Very economic. And with the YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. All you need is a Google account, which I'm sure you all have anyway, and a current form of payment. And then you can cancel anytime if you're not satisfied. And while you start getting ready to sign up, you can also think about the 24-25 odds for the upcoming NBA season. Our friends at FanDuel, they've got Anthony Davis as 150 to 1 for MVP, also 25 to 1. For Defensive Player of the Year, Dalton Connect 10 to 1 for Rookie of the Year, Max Christie 150 to 1 for Most Improved Player. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. My last table setting question, I think, because this to me is one of these things that I think is in the background of every decision that Rob Palenka and, and the front office has made, really just Rob Palenka because he's the only one there. Um, how how surprised are the Lakers, do you think, that LeBron is still this good? They signed, this is year seven, right, Andy? I, I lose track. Yes, still on the team. Like Right, still on the team, still this good, still on the team, still some of that you need to sign to... They signed him in 2018, right. for those who don't remember the exact year. Right, and so now, and like they just entered into a, a, a max extension, like with whatever you want, like how you want one year, great, you want three years, fine, um, and you have to do it. How surprised do you think the Lakers are that they still are in the LeBron James business in this way? That's a really fascinating question that um i've been thinking about as well because i feel like the lakers would be th not thrilled to put this era behind them and move on but they kind of verbalized and you saw with the flirting with dan hurley like we want to become this developmental program and the the new CBA and the second apron and all that sort of stuff is um, on our minds and we want to prepare for that. But at the same time, it's really difficult, if not, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's hard to have the contender that you want around LeBron and then also still have anything that's not scorched earth Mm -hmm. post lebron so it's a really i will admit it's a really difficult right. position and, with, to and be with, in. like anthony davis is you know he's getting 30 ish whatever but like you can yeah. project out and say like we anthony davis can be around for three or four years like you can look at that confidently and say that might get hurt a little bit and some of like he's going to be anthony davis can be around whatever lebron it's like if you told me like up oh, man the decline it hit here it is it finally came and it came faster or whatever, or the big injury, whatever it is, like that's what happened to Kobe, um, essentially ending his his career as a high-end player. Right. Um, I could believe that, but I could also believe that if you told me that LeBron is doing 90% of what he's doing today in three years, I totally believe that too. And it's 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 a it's a it's an unprecedented NBA problem. It, it's funny, Michael, like the idea of you know, what do the Lakers do with this? And when you were saying before, it's like, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult to try to maximize this time with LeBron while also trying to prepare yourself at all for a future because the future may feel both close and far away at the same time. Mm -hmm. There was a part of me that thought you were going to say it's it, not impossible, but very difficult to walk away from LeBron. Because in certain respects, 
the simplest, cleanest way for the Lakers to plan for anything moving forward, even if it was just we will maximize Anthony Davis, would be to not have LeBron on the roster because it, he's a very specific guy to plan around. There is always going to be a magnified pressure with LeBron on the roster without having necessarily even an idea of what is the end game with LeBron and like what is the end point with LeBron. It it makes for a it makes for a planning thing uh, planning situation for the Lakers that really like a lot of things with LeBron right now. There's no template for right, and it's not like they have control of all their draft capital. So it's it's interesting, and and you know the like the report. I don't know how much validity there is there, but the you know revisiting the Golden State Warriors. Um, Rumor with LeBron at the last year's trade deadline that's been in the news a little bit over the past couple of days. And, um, you know, it being said that Rich Paul was the person who's kind of who shot down that possibility is very interesting to me because, yeah, again, like it is really difficult to walk away from LeBron James, right? Um, but if you can get really valuable stuff for LeBron now and have AD and have you know, whatever's left over there, obviously you'd still have Austin Reeves and whatever pieces that you like. Um, you still have the organization, the magnet that is the Los Angeles Lakers. Um, would you want that if you were a genie bus? And then obviously there's less pressure there. Like it's just, it's a fat. Yeah. It's a, it's a fascinating question. Just the idea of like what you could get for LeBron is, is a, is a, is a, is a hard, question to answer because of all the things that we've been talking about um is he, when you look including at what, his no trade clause right so you have to make a deal that works for both teams and works for lebron when you when you kind of break down the the lakers and how they've gone since let's we'll say since winning that title in, in in 2020 what do you see as the fundamental flaw or flaws to how they've they've proceeded since then well <laughs> i mean i think like the russell westbrook trade is just kind of where you begin all of this yeah and the summer of 2021 you did a really good inventory michael in this piece that we talked about and everybody should check out on the ringer we'll put it in the show notes of the different either mistakes, regrets, whatever the Lakers may have. But really, the summer of 2021 is where I think things may have gone permanently sideways for the Lakers in terms of the window for LeBron. Right. I, I just think, like, um, not only was it I, – I thought at the time that it was uh, unwise and not a great fit for a variety of reasons, but I just think, like <laughs> – <laughs> <laughs> you weren't alone. <laughs> but like, Unwise and not a great fit is the most polite yes. way I've ever, <laughs> framing I've ever heard of that. Trade. Very respectful to Rob Belinka right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I went at him in the piece, so I feel like now it's my mother taught me nice. that if I can't say anything nice, I don't, but I, I am I'm supposed to say something. So I will say unwise and not a great fit. Yes, but I, I think like philosophically, it's also something that I I would push back against in the sense that they wanted this. Obviously, they want and LeBron had a hand in this as well. Um, you know, another superstar talent, another all star capable talent, a productive player who has pedigree in the NBA. That's someone that they wanted, um, but also someone who could ease the playmaking and ball handling burden on LeBron and um, in doing so sacrifice one of the best some like in KCP one of the best um role players and most like sensible fits around someone like LeBron James in a playoff setting and ironically he goes to the team that has just been a thorn in their side ever since in the postseason um but yeah that I mean it's that that trade right there is just such a uh flashpoint yeah it, it's been that's a great way to put it um and ever since looking back, there are little moves that they've made that you can definitely like wag your finger at or shake your head at or whatever. I mean, I, I cited um, the need to keep Taylor Horton Tucker, who was very intriguing, I suppose, in terms of like his physical profile and 
how he played and there was upside there and they needed upside for a variety of reasons, but to hold on to him when someone like Kyle Lowry was available and still productive um, was costly. Um, I thought that the, I'm not a D'Angelo Russell fan and really never have been. I don't think he's a winning basketball player. Um, I think he seduces people with his shot making and sometimes it's really impressive for sure. Um, but I would much rather have Mike Conley, and I think Mike Conley is a better fit next to LeBron James as well um, in a postseason setting. So uh, the decision to take D'Angelo Russell when that transaction went down, I thought was pretty costly. And then um, something that I think is forgotten, uh, the Alex Caruso departure, which... He I can is, promise you it's not forgotten here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I, 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 I was on vacation when that happened with my family, and I, I put up a quick video about it, and it is fair to say I freaked the bleep out. What you're talking about here is, you know, whether it's Russ or whatever, is is related to one of the points you make about uh, Palenka and his feel in terms of when to hit the continuity button and when to hit the change button. And I, I want to dive into that a little bit more next. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by BetterHelp. What are your self-care non-negotiables? Maybe you never skip leg day when you go to the gym, but do those gym days come at the expense of therapy days? And when your schedule gets packed with work and your significant other, kids' activities, errands you got to run, just day-to-day -day stuff, it can become really easy to let priorities about yourself slip. But ironically, when you have no time for yourself, that's when therapy becomes a more important non-negotiable than ever. And therapy can help you focus on the things that you want instead of what other people have. And you can start living your best life. I can attest to how speaking with a professional therapist helped me and my family during a really difficult period, just figuring out compromises that don't feel like you're leaving yourself unheard or completely unfulfilled. And if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. Designed to be flexible, suited to your schedule, visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on NBA. At it, Michael, at, the, at that year, like there are some people who think, you know, the Lakers should have run it back uh, after 2020. Uh, Andy and I are both thought you couldn't really do it exactly the same way just because of the compressed time frame and they needed some help and you know it was it would have been very difficult to just roll that thing back and some of the changes that they made um were were needed the 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 westbrook thing though when you write about the lakers never quite knowing when to go lean into continuity versus leaning into mm -hmm. change the part of what made me so mad about the westbrook trade part because there are so many things um is that it was a, a colossal overreaction to that season. Everybody got hurt. But if you rewind it, they started the season 21 and 6. And so, like, that was a pretty good team that got totally decimated by injuries. And I still believe that it had Anthony Davis not gotten hurt in the first round against Phoenix, they probably advanced to a conference final because I think they would have won that series. They were winning. He gets hurt and he doesn't. So I think that is an example of a massive overreaction they're still paying for. But you're right that when they went to the conference finals a couple of seasons ago and they had that run, which I think you were, uh, I think the adjective you used was miraculous that they overreacted into continuity, uh, perhaps in sort of running that group back, which I assume is, is part of that is the, is the Delo thing. C can you talk a little bit more about kind of what you're thinking about when you, when you balance that continuity versus change, Thing. Yeah, I thought that that run was, I used the word, was I used miraculous? I think so. Um, you know, it's like, I just didn't think that they were as good as a team that was, you know, eight wins away from winning an NBA championship for a variety of reasons. And when I saw that, like, I guess like this is just like the Kyrie Irving question. And that's like he was uh conceivably available at that at that during that offseason. And there would have been a lot of things you'd have to do to get him in onto your roster. 
um, cap wise. I understand that. And it's like a complicated machination thing, but that's the type of move that I would have. <laughs> there are also a couple things to be concerned about with Kyrie. hundred percent. Absolutely. No. A hundred, a, hey, I'm not a fan. Um, absolutely. And I'm not even look whether fan or not. I'm just saying the fact remains like there were things to yeah. be concerned about. <laughs> absolutely. And I'm throwing, I'm throwing his name and, and what he has since been with the Dallas yeah. Mavericks. So just as an example, he's been uh, terrific of someone who has a history with LeBron who, um, you know, there was maybe one or two buyers potentially in the the Kyrie Irving market. It would be obviously the Dallas Mavericks and then conceivably the Los Angeles Lakers. Um, and I just thought that that was like the perfect time to like tilt what you are a little bit, particularly if you were concerned with LeBron's um, usage and his load. And instead what they did was, they really bought in on Austin Reeves taking another step forward. They thought, and look, I'm not a huge Rui fan, and I'm not a huge D'Lo fan. So well, you just, just hate this roster, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> That's become really clear. <laughs> and I just thought that re-signing those two guys was a signal, obviously, that I think we're like we're we're good enough. And I think before uh, last season, I wrote the. Oh, this is like they're clearly going to just trade for Jeremy Grant before the trade deadline. Who's like that's the type? But again, that's the type of player who just made so much sense um, on the Lakers next to uh, LeBron, next to Anthony Davis. He's a two-way wing, shot making ability, a little bit of playmaking ability, can guard multiple positions, and it makes more sense in a playoff setting than either, in my opinion, Rui or D'Angelo Russell. And it's just been a lot of static instead since. And I think like what triggered me to even write this piece watching LeBron in the Olympics was I like doubled back and looked at the moves that they made this summer. And I'm like, okay, who's, who's off the team from last year's roster and who's on the team. And it's like, I, this is a joke. I need to refresh the real GM roster turnover <laughs> page here. Like I, there's after a first round exit where they win one playoff game, there was nothing that happened. And so I'm left scratching my head. I'm like, that, this is how can you not address what, like an issue with the team beyond the, the like, unless you believe that Darvin ham is like the, the problem the rotten the the reason why everything was rotten at the core and just bringing JJ Redick in would change everything stylistically aesthetically on the court which I don't believe but um keeping the same roster together I just if you're talking about winning a championship um or contending for a championship I thought that much more change needed to be done and well, that, that that actually leads to what I wanted to ask you next because you wrote in in your piece that there are moves to be made I was wondering what are some of the ones that you think the Lakers should be looking for that you think they could have done like Jeremy Grant for example Brian and I recently had um uh Mike Richmond from Locked on Blazers on to talk specifically about Grant when he was mm -hmm. heavily connected to the Lakers. And he has, he has a lot of doubts about the Grant fit for the Lakers, spe specifically if it required two first-round picks, which he thought would be flat-out lunacy from the Lakers' perspective. But also that Grant's defensive ability has started to slow down and that, and that age is starting to become part of a thing. And for this team specifically, he's got to be able to guard wings and maybe bigger guards just in terms of what you want to prevent LeBron from doing. And like, I know the Lakers attempted to really overpay Clay Thompson pretty badly. It just, it didn't work out like yeah. the DeMar DeRozan thing. I don't think was ever really realistic for DeMar unless he was going to take a pay cut that I don't blame him for saying no to what, do you have an idea of what you think they could or should be doing this summer? Because I feel like this summer, in a lot of ways, some of I don't feel like this summer is as much squandering LeBron as it more is them being stuck in part because of the other things from previous years where they squandered LeBron. Yeah, like this no, summer, fair. 
I, I feel like this summer has been, and I don't want to sound like I'm trying to take up for Palinka because Brian and I have both said many times, Jeannie Buss could and should do better. But the situation is still the situation. So I'm just, I'm just wondering what you think is out there, was out there that they should have done specifically this offseason. I think that there, there are two – and look, like – I think that this offseason was difficult for a lot of teams that were hamstrung for a variety of reasons and trying to adapt to the new CBA, and the Lakers are one of those teams. Um, we're living in an apron world, Michael. Uh, yeah, Rob Lincoln tells us this all the time. It's not fun. Um, there, are, <laughs> there are two players, though, who signed um, – first of all, you bring up Clay, who I think is a really good example of someone who ended up taking less money to go to um, – the Dallas Mavericks, a team that was just made the finals, but isn't that much better than the like? I, you know, like I don't know how you guys feel about that. I don't. I just I, they if made. they were willing to go four and eighty for Clay, I think that was insane. Fair. I mean, they uh, can't I, make I, him take the money. <laughs> like, no, that's I actually, fair. I've, I am far more concerned that they apparently tried to pay Clay that and, money, and, than, and than they also they, the Warriors didn't want to take back salary. You know, they created that exception that they used for Heald and I think slow mo. So, you know, it was a matter of finding I, that third team right. for I, d I, I think there are two players that kind of come to mind who signed um, very below market contracts that I think would be really useful for the Lakers. And look, like it's really hard to – like there's other teams that are – I'm there's so many caveats here, so I apologize. But there's like a lot of – I understand that there's a lot of teams that can promise things that maybe the Lakers can't and – um everybody's kind of hamstrung in the same way, but like, why isn't Gary Trent, how do, how do you not get Gary Trent Jr. as like, if you're the Lakers and you're promising, just like, I just feel like it was a, it's a wonderful situation for him. I'm not saying the Bucks is like a bad one, but I think it's better. It, it, but I think, I think at the core, what the, what you're getting at with the criticisms here and the criticisms and the stories, there's, there's always been a fundamental kind of lack of creativity with what the Lakers do they they rarely do anything where you go, well, how the hell they do that? Like, that's really like, you know, I, I mean, granted trade with the bulls is always a good strategy for anything. If you want to make yourself look good, but like, how do we get Alex Caruso without giving up a single first round pick? Or how do we route this guy here? And, you know, you send this guy over there and then like, there are GMs around the league that, you know, you, you look at, like, well, God damn, that was clever. Um, and the Lakers do not make a lot of those moves. Uh, and I think that at the core, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's these are hard, and it's like that's his job. I mean, he's the general manager of the Los Angeles Lakers. He's supposed to see these avenues better than I can, right? <laughs> I, I would think. Yeah, I think it's a it's a really good point. Just backing yourself, it's kind of a compounded issue here, where you're backing yourself into a corner where you don't have a. Like you didn't draft Jaime Jaquez Jr., for example, mm -hmm. which like is what I look like, like, you know, it's a mid first round pick. But like in the moment, you're kind of like anyone. If you talk to anyone who knew anything about the draft, it's like, why didn't they take Jaime Jaquez Jr.? That didn't make a lot of sense there. Um, and so and having maybe you can you have one more chip that you can use exactly to make trade that you need. Mm -hmm. like, you know, right. You give yourself more flexibility yeah. to do things like that, where if you're uh, if you're Sam Presti with the Oklahoma City Thunder, you've been You've done a genius. You have all these assets for sure, but you've done a genius job using the picks that you've had to entice a team like the Chicago, Chicago Bulls to take a Josh Giddy who you don't even need because of all these other players who are popping up who are much better that you've drafted in recent years. So, um, so yeah, it's like the, the when I say like they didn't sign, I, I, I feel like that's kind of an unfair criticism to say they didn't sign Gary Tritt Jr. They didn't sign Tyus Jones, um, who signed for the vet men for, with the Phoenix Suns, who I think is like really good and awesome and would have been valuable and can get on the floor in the playoffs. Um, but like they didn't do anything else. See, like they didn't like I, I know their resources are are are. are not great, but yeah. you would like to see just a little more aggression, maybe. And there, there are avenues to be aggressive if you're wanting to be aggressive. Yeah, and these these players are literal players. Gary Trent Jr. is a, is a literal human. You know, Jonas Valanciunas. These are real people, but they're also types. 
There are also, yeah. you know, categories. There, there are things like that. And it's like, you know, there, there are ways to, uh, you need to find ways to get to these places if you are going to try. And maybe they still will. But, um, you know, they, they also have a problem, this maybe for the next time you're on, about overselling and underdelivering delivering um, because they keep promising, well, in the summertime, we'll be able, all these picks will be able to be much more aggressive. And then no. So they, <laughs> they, they have that problem as well. Uh, he is Michael Penai, and he is one of the great basketball writers at The Ringer. It is a fantastic story, really breaking down where LeBron still is, how good he still is, and where the Lakers have gone wrong. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, man. We really appreciate it. Andy, Brian, this was a pleasure. Thanks so much, guys. Locked on Lakers on YouTube is where you can go hang out with over 25,000 subscribers. Uh, make sure to check out. Thanks for checking our show out first thing every morning. Make sure you go uh, look at Locked on NBA. It is, uh, you know, the offseason never, ever, ever stops. That's why we're on five days a week. Uh, part of the Locked on Network, your team every day. We'll see everyone on Monday.